Welcome to another edition of the Creators Outlet brought to you by our friends over at the Inked Marketing Team. You need a little extra help on your Kickstarter Indiegogo? Contact Kevin Gillette over at Ink Marketing. Just go to www.ink.marketing today. And now, with no further ado, we'd like to welcome our special guest with his award-winning series, Back in Action, Loco Hero 2. Mr. Moore, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's nice of you to, to come back. And uh, I just finished reading uh, the other week, uh, issue one of Blood and Bullets. Oh, right on. What did you think? And, uh, I liked it. <laughs> I, I, I really dug it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, I'm looking forward to number two of that. And uh, it is, I, it is I, I spent a couple of, I spent a couple of days flipping my 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 blood and bullets poker chip around and uh, oh right on <laughs> yeah those turned out nice like I really like the weight and the way those uh, oh yeah they, those, they came out, they came out really good yeah so uh, issue two is already drawn and in the can same art team mm -hmm. and uh, as soon as the coloring is done on Loco Hero two which will be in the next one to two days. Uh, then uh, my color is Sean Callahan here in Colorado. Uh, we'll move back over to Blood and Bullets, start coloring it. And then we haven't picked an exact launch date for the second uh, issue of Blood and Bullets, uh, but we're planning on doing a campaign sometime in the November, December timeframe. Oh, that works. I'll have birthday money. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be, I'll be look, I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, I love, I love westerns. I used to watch all the spaghetti westerns and, uh, sure, you know the the movies and stuff. And I, I still do. Yeah, um, what I did with that one was, is I took a hundred page screenplay that I'd already written, and then I just basically turned the screenplay over to the artist Silvano Beltramo, and I was like, you know make a hundred page graphic novel out of this. So the, all the information and dialogue and everything was there. Cause I wrote blood and bullets uh, 10 years ago, tw almost 12 years ago. And, um, uh, so the, that first story arc, which you read in issue one will wrap up in issue two and provided, uh, you know, people still like it. Then I'll start writing new, uh, new episodes and new graphic novels and just continue that and local hero and other, projects you know forward yeah uh i i was just sitting back in awe with your uh with your photos from your trip to disney with oh uh, <laughs> i'm like oh i'll like, tell you what it was, Yoda. It, was, it was hot down there that time oh, of year though God, too it's, i know i i'm not one uh to live in much humidity here in colorado so you know uh florida in the july was sticky yeah, you never never want to go down there. I got I have cousins down there. They're like, if you want to come down, you can stay with us. I go, for what? Uh, <laughs> if I go, I know I go. Look, thirty years ago, I probably would have. He goes, yeah, you could have gone to Disney. Then I go, I wouldn't. I'm not gonna. I don't go on rides, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pay somebody to walk around their park. I'm like, yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not a big rides guy for, even though I motorcycle and I do all sorts of stuff, I get motion sickness on rides, something fierce. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of that doesn't agree with me, but my next signing, which is where I got my little droid depot shirt here, um, I, that I do down there, I, I will definitely negotiate or ask for a pass ahead of time so I can go to the actual Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, because I just assumed I was going to have a pass and I hadn't made a reservation. And then I got down there and there was no reservations available and I didn't have a pass. Oh, so I got I got a little bit host on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. You know, I, I guess they're trying to save money with all the actors from the MCU suing them for not, <laughs> not getting their money. I'm like... Well, you know, want to play, you got to pay. You got a contract with somebody, you know, don't, don't look for a loophole. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy, but let's talk about loco hero. Absolutely. Now, uh, it was nominated for a whole bunch of awards 
And no, I so didn't. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't. I didn't see how how that ended. So. Yeah. So the um, there's uh, through another sort of podcast is how I found out about it. But um, you know, fans of indie comics. So there mm -hmm. was uh, an awards. I don't know organization or movement. It was called the Independent Creator Awards, and it ran. I want to say. So this, it must have been like January, right? So 2020 had already ended. And then fans could nominate what they thought was the best thing they read or saw. And there was tons and tons of categories, right? Best colorist, best writing, you know, this sort of thing. So some of my fans nominated Loco Hero and myself for um, uh, best cover art. And the one that won cover of the year was the honor bound cover, which is the cover that went to raise money and awareness for PTSD for veterans. Uh, and that was a piece of cover art that I did. It wasn't one of the variant cover artists that were on the project. So that was very fulfilling. And then I was also runner up for both indie publisher of the year and indie character of the year for Loco hero. And the runner up was to uh, Coffin Comics and Lady Death, who have a, a very large and loyal fan following. So I was proud to be second fiddle to, you know, a, a publisher who has an additional 20 or 25 years. On yeah, top I, I, I might have I might have heard of that character. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, and so uh, so that was great, you know, uh, very fulfilling for me. Uh, I think, I don't know what's going on with the Ringo Awards. I think uh, we were also nominated for that, but I don't really know how the next stage of after nominations happens um, with some of those. Um, and, you know, a lot of different conventions used to have their own individual awards. So one yeah. convention might have the Harveys and somebody else has the Eisners and somebody else has Ink Pot. And so there, there's a variety of, awards out there. And since I'm new to self-publishing, I don't know too much about that part because I'm in the past, I've always been more of just the uh, cover freelance artist. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, I know I voted for you on the Ringos, and oh, then, right I went, on. then I went, then I went through, then I went through other categories. Oh and, yeah, there's great ones. And, there. and, and I'm, I basically voted for other creators that I, you know, other creators and artists that I knew. I'm like, Oh yeah, I know him. Yeah, I'm gonna click, right. and you know, yeah. on to on to yeah. the next one. I'm like, yeah, make your voice they, be heard. They do, you know, they do good work. So, mm -hmm. absolutely. I know when I was in college, I was uh, I was one of the uh, one of the many hundreds of people on the on the uh, nomination board for uh, the Saturn Awards back in the day. Oh, cool. Well, that's kind of a big one. Yeah. So yeah, I was I was excited every time I got something in the mail from them, like, okay, uh, pick the pick the ones in all these categories you you want to nominate, and you know, like a month later, I'd get a letter in, you know, showing who went through, and right, then they'd be like, now you have to write something about that because your choice uh, won an award, so we want you to write some. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's Hugo's and Chesley's and Saturn awards and Oh yeah. Yeah, a lot in the science fiction, you know, world for sure. Mm, there's 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 a lot going on. So, uh tell us all about Loco Hero and uh and how how this came about. Uh as far as how the story originally came to me or just kind of what's involved with campaign number 2. Um let's go into the campaign after just go into uh you know, how you came about the story and, and how that all, all progressed over time. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I I was at San Diego Comic-Con in 2016, and I just had lunch with a friend of mine who was a fellow filmmaker because we had worked on a couple of feature films together. There were indie film projects, one that he wrote and one that I wrote. And so before the show got going, he and I went and had lunch, and, and we were – we were talking about indie filmmaking. I said, well, if you were going to do an indie film, you know, would you right now in the current market, would you do horror, you know, low budget horror? Like a lot of people do. It's like the low hanging fruit. 
And he said, nah, I don't think I would. He said, I think superhero is going to be hot for a while. He said, I think I'd try to figure out how to do a low cost superhero project. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, I'd seen things like super, obviously kick-ass was a great example of a hero that doesn't necessarily have hero powers who exists Mm -hmm. in our more normal world, normal ish. And so later that night I was uh, coming back from, I think being over at the Hilton or something like that. And um, I was walking in front of the convention center. It was the night of the, uh, uh, cos- it was either the costume party or there was just cosplayers who were running about and coming down the left side of me. I remember there was three or four costume cosplayers fully dressed up. And then at the same time that I was passing them, I noticed that there was a woman in the street pushing her cart next to me. And she was uh, obviously very uh, mentally challenged. She was having a very loud argument with herself and kind of yelling incoherently and she was pushing her cart. And so I thought to myself, well, what if I had a superhero to combine these two things? She lived on the street. She dressed like a superhero and much like them, they don't have powers, but like the sort of pseudo crazy lady, if you excuse the vernacular, um, what thought she was a superhero. And I said, okay, my character is going to be homeless and is going to think she's a superhero. And that in the beginning, that's all I had. Then I was pretty excited about the idea. And on the way, on the drive back to Colorado, which is an 18 hour drive, um, my buddy who was with me helping sharing some of the driving, I said, okay, you drive. I'm going to take notes. And we kind of talked out and hashed out different ideas. And so when the idea was a hero, and that she was crazy, I thought, okay, well, wow, loco hero really rolls off the tongue, right? You get this nice kind of alliteration, rhyming. I guess it's actually rhyming, not alliteration. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, I said, okay, well, so that it, that language ties in, I'm going to make my character a Latina because I wanted her to be sexy and beautiful, but I wanted her to be strong and capable and, you know, kick ass basically. Uh, and so I gave, I decided that she would have a military background and had taken martial arts most of her life. So I started building the backstory from there. And so, uh, for anybody who's read the first issue after she's hit on the head, when she's trying to rescue a fellow person that lives on the street, uh, much like she does, she has what they call a dissociative disorder. And that means she might, uh, uh, Hey pops, what's shaking? Uh, she might, um, uh, go into like almost a fugue state where she gets confused in the flight or fight mode. Mm -hmm. So she might be fighting street thugs who are there trying to clear the streets out. And she might think that they're, dressed as ninjas. So if she thinks they're ninjas, then she envisions herself as a samurai, as the hero. And so it creates this great um, visual world within the comic because rather than just having a variant cover that says, look, I drew my character as a samurai. I'm not doing that just to sell books. In the actual book, there would be pages and chapters where when she fights, you know, she might picture herself as 1930s, you know, gangsters in one issue or a Roman guard or, you know, just any, you know, Western setting. And so uh, that makes for really cool, unique art, ties it all together. And then there's actually another comics tie in within the story. And there's a young boy who's also at the shelter and he's reading a comic that I called the crusader and he becomes in some ways a narrator and she might be out fighting crime. And then he reads a line of this sort of crusader character who says he's crawling through the streets that are, you know, the bowels of the city. And you get this kind of noir throwback Batman kind of character called the crusader. And it ties in with the fact that, she's a hero and she's going out and doing things like Batman might. However, Batman has every resource in the world. 
He's got a butler and people who make weapons for him, like Fox. And he's got unlimited money. All right. And he's got a great house. He's got a mm -hmm. bat cave. He can come home to all this stuff. So if you take a hero and you strip away all of that, and she says, I am still going to go out and fight crime because I'm a hero. No money, no car, no home, no shelter. Her costume is made from elements that are from the donation center. And so, you know, her outfit is cobbled together and it's a jazzer size outfit from the 80s. It's rollerblade pads. It's ski goggles on her head, but she thinks they're night vision goggles. And she's like, oh, this is going to, you know, help me see better. But I don't want to wear a bunch of big bulky armor like Batman does. I need to be able to be able to move and be free. So she has an outfit that is more of your classic retro throwback spandex kind of outfit because that's what in her brain that's what she thinks a superhero might wear because those are the comics that she would have seen in the 70s and 80s growing up mm -hmm. that's what i saw exactly and um so you know she comes across other people who are basically like lady you're crazy you know like you're running around like a costume superhero you know trying to fight crime and when she wakes up in the hospital, she sees her x-ray up on the wall and she thinks her bones have been like reinforced and laced with adamantium or something like that. And they really weren't, but that's her impression. They're like, oh man, they, they, I'm reinforced now. I'm indestructible. So she goes off and does crazy crap, not knowing that she's just like everybody else. Uh, and so again, that makes for a lot of bravado on her part. And, you know, 90% of the time she can back it up because she got serious military and martial arts skills. Yeah. It sounds like me playing when I was five and, uh, exactly. <laughs> I, I could, I could never back it up. I remember getting my butt kicked, uh, after school in the elementary yard, uh, because I thought I knew Kung Fu because I watched Hong <laughs> Kong Fui. Uh, yeah. that, that did not work out well, uh, yeah. but it did get my mother to actually put me in karate. So, there you, go. Uh, you know, you know, she's, she's doing the right, re the right things, things that we would all like to do, go out and fight injustice and help those who can't. Mm -hmm. um, but she's doing it for the wrong reasons. Not, not because those reasons aren't just or justified, they're only the wrong reasons because in her head they're skewed. So there's a there's a page that I love in the first issue. And I wrote it where she's reading the article about the guy who's kind of the villain is a, a real estate developer. And he's doing all sorts of shady, you know, crap to get the city to go his way. And they're going to scrape the slums, which is called Bridgeton. Bridgetown, it's the area near the bridges and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the shelter, which is called Hope House, and all that area is going to get redeveloped. And when she's reading this article about this developer who's going to put in this mall and redevelop it, she reads about every tenth word. And the tenth, every tenth word comes out to this guy is really building a super villain headquarters. <laughs> So it's almost like one of those things where if you were watching a movie, like those those words would shoot out in red and you'd be like, oh, it's like a code. You know, it's the matrix. And and I had to write it in a way where I got in those words uh, so that that all came together. And she's like, oh, I got to stop this guy because he wants he really wants to develop this mall underneath the mall is going to be a super villain headquarters so i got to stop him so her reasons are different even though what he's doing is super crappy to the people that live there on the streets who have nowhere else to go so he starts having street thugs and stuff come in and start clearing the streets and you know putting the muscle on the people that live there so that they're not uh, they can say, oh, yeah, we're not impacting many uh, people who live there. They're being relocated to, you know, this tent city that we've set out for them far on the edge of town where there's like no resources. And and she sees that and the inner her inner workings of how she, how she is develops into a uh, 
into an interesting story because she is fighting, you know, pretty bad people, you know, uh, you know, plugs going in, you know. Well, and their, their paths are crossing because of the, what's going on in her neighborhood. And so mm -hmm. even if she decides to go uh, in the first issue, she kind of, you know, like attacks this kind of like meth house, but it's also where the same bad guys already are that are working for, you know, this villainous character, whose name's Rainer, who's a Danish guy, the great Dane. And so I think it's fun combining the things that we all grew up with, with comics, the fun stuff, you know, characters with cool nicknames and people doing superhero stuff, but it's actually still very grounded. Right. And in the scene where she's about to go save her friend, who's getting the, the, the thugs put on her, she's eaten out of a garbage can because the, the hope house ran out of food and she gave the last bit of food to other people that she thought, you know, needed it more. And so I can't think of a character in comics that I've ever come across. Not that I'm the most well-read person. I mean, there's thousands of comics out there, but you know, I can't think of one who thinks she's a superhero. who eats garbage and lives in a cardboard box and is just living in her own world, but she's going out and she's doing these sort of somewhat superhuman things, even though she herself is not superhuman. Yeah. It's a, uh... It's an interesting twist, and yeah, it's it's very like nineteen uh, seventies, eighties, Bronze Age kind of right kind of well, feel to well, the to it's the story. Fun. And you know, one of the things that I do with her character too is is I put a lot of Easter eggs from pop culture that's both comics, movies, you know, sometimes uh, radio, you know, lyrics references. So she watched and grew up with all the same stuff we did. Right. So there's a scene in issue two where she, you know, chucks this guy across the roof and she's like, and the quarterback is toast. Right. <laughs> now, if you know, die hard, right. You're going to know that's a line from die hard. And she's going to be somebody who's going to be influenced by those kind of movies. And somebody might go, Oh, you, you ripped off die hard there. You're like, no, like her character, like that's just one of her things is like, we all do. Like I am a movie quoting son of a gun and if i have a chance to say you know law don't go around here law dog I, i'm gonna say those things because like that's <laughs> a movie reference from tombstone that i'm gonna love to say and other people are gonna be like yeah man, that's tombstone i get that <laughs> of course my favorite one is i'm not your huckleberry so uh, of course <laughs> <laughs> i've got that t-shirt somewhere too so it's so sometimes I go with the deep cuts and sometimes I go with the ones that people are, you know, they're going to know that one the most. <laughs> mm, yeah. You'll shoot your eye out. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the most famous quotes. And then, you know, especially if you've, if you've been watching some of the older movies recently, uh, you'll, you'll pull like these obscure quotes out. Oh like, yeah, like yeah, oh, you that, do that, something from the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there's like you know, there's people who dig, and there's people who have guns, and you dig, you know, like you're gonna have to know <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly to get that one. Oh yeah, and you know, I those the the pieces of that movie behind you are just amazing. Oh, thank you. I still remember as a as a kid when I put two and two together and realized that uh, Lee Van Cleef was in that movie and uh, the TV show, the master that I used to watch religiously, like every week that I thought was, was cool. He never like really did anything, but <laughs> yeah, but we loved those charismatic characters. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was, it was fun for me to watch and, you know, it was just like a hero, another hero's journey thing. Well, I, and I always look back at like different shows that I loved at the time. And, you know, if somebody's like, well, what's your favorite show right now? And, you know, maybe it wasn't Dukes of Hazzard, but it was Airwolf. And you're like, yeah, this guy's like mysterious past. And he's got this like amazing helicopter and he goes and, you know, gets to go on all these cool missions. And I'm oh like, I thought that show was absolutely badass. And so I'm sure all of those references and things from Star Wars to everything else bleed through once you take that step as a writer, right? Mm -hmm. And because you're influenced by all those things, just like Lucasfilm was influenced by Seven Samurai and 
you know, a million other things out there that make the amalgamation of what is Star Wars, which is essentially a Western space opera. Yeah. You know, and yeah. the Mandalorian, they even amped it up. Mandalorian is absolutely a Western in space. Oh, yeah. You know, there's even the, oh, this is the new sheriff in town episode. Oh, this is the go get the kid, you know, uh, rescue episode. This is, I need help from the bad guys. I got to go help them do something. But, he, you know, he always finds his, his balance with his loyalty and what his character is because at his core, you know, he's a noble. He's a ronin. He's a samurai. Yeah, it's uh, it's been very interesting so far, and I I'm very very much looking forward to uh, to season three of that show. Absolutely, I thought, yeah. I thought uh, out of everything that that company's done, like the last few years, um, I think that and the Bad Batch are the only two things uh, worth worth my time and money to watch. So. Yeah, I give different shows and stuff a try. I'm actually enjoying, um, uh, oh, it's a sp big space sci-fi one that is was on Amazon. Or no, it was on sci-fi, now it's on Amazon. The Expanse. Oh, it's yeah, just, yeah. You know, good, good, solid science fiction. Yeah, I, I started watching that and... Uh then got distracted. I don't know whether it was something shiny or a squirrel or, you know, my daughter, my daughter yelling at me that she wanted me to make spaghetti for dinner. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I started the expanse years ago and I only got a few episodes. And then my buddy who I've known since the fourth grade was like, dude, you're going to love the expanse. You got to watch it. So I'm like, Oh man, I, I trust you. So I started watching again and I was like, Oh yeah, this, this is good. Good show. Yeah. I, I saw like the, I think like the first like two or three episodes and I really liked it. Yeah. And uh, it's on it's on a couple of different uh, of the free apps. Uh, oh, is it? it? Okay. It, it floats in and out. So well, it's on am, Amazon now, and I get Amazon Prime. So yeah, I I, I, I used to get Amazon Prime, but uh, I I can't I canceled it. But I'm I think I'm gonna go go and get it back because they they put a thing up with the uh, the Paramount Plus network. Okay. That if, if you've got Amazon uh, for 99 cents a month, you can get uh, Amazon Music Unlimited and Paramount Plus for 99 cents a month. Oh, geez, that's a smoking deal. And I'm like, well, I don't really need the music. I was a DJ for 30 plus years. So <laughs> you got plenty of music. I, I, I've got plenty of music, but. Um, I, I can never get enough Star Trek, especially the original series. Yeah. Now, I have it all on, you know, DVD. I got the original, like, DVD box sets and everything, but uh, it's the, do I really want to unpack those and, you know, have to load a disc in when I can, <laughs> you know, for a dollar a month, I can just pay for this and leave it on and let it play and, and, and be happy and content. Yeah. Right. Here, take my money. Uh, exactly. You know, so it's like, you know, once you organize your DVDs, you actually don't want to take anything out and use it. You want to wait to see, you know, do a Alexa search for <laughs> and wait exactly. to see, you know, where it's playing that month. And if you had that service to to watch it, you know, so. Yeah, I do. Uh, I almost always have something on in the studio I'm working and I and I work late in that. So I almost out. Most of the time, it's either a TV show or a movie. And if it's something where I really have to focus on what I'm doing, then it has to be something I have seen many times. In other words, I won't put on that new movie that's Black Widow or, uh, oh, I don't know, whatever the newest thing that just came out, Suicide Squad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's got to be something like, oh, I've seen the Jack Ryan series a couple times. I can put it on in the background and I don't need to look up at it, you know. Yeah, I'll 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 put something uh, like if I'm I'm reading a graphic novel for a show I'm doing tomorrow night, uh, and I'll I'll put on I don't know like uh, like the old Battlestar Galactica because I I can actually you know repeat the the all the lines through the <laughs> entire thing you know I've, yeah, I've been a such fan a fan of. of of the original series as well. Yeah. 
I still, to this day, I still think one of the coolest ship designs ever is the, is from Battlestar Galactica. And I think it came up in some sort of news feed and they were like, you know, here's the 150 or $400 version, you know, of the Battlestar Galactica fighters. And I was like, do I need one of those for the studio? And I'm like, no, no, you stay focused. You know, like, I, really, I need like, one of I was, those, but I was tempted because I it was like, I not, need one of those. Not for the $400. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> Cause it's the same comp, uh, the same company that made those, uh, also made the space 1999 ones. Now, see, I had the big space 1999 toy. That was a hand-me-down that came from the, gar uh, like a garage sale, but mm -hmm. I didn't have any of the figures that went with it. So space 1999 just got absorbed into the star Wars world. And so it had star Wars characters and stuff like that in it. Cause I was like, well, they, you know, this, these are the dudes I have. So they live on this ship now. <laughs> I remember I told my mother one year that I wanted, uh, you know, space 1999 figures. And they were like the 12 inch figures. Yeah. But they were GI Joe size. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were made like, uh, but the skin, the skin on them was like actual skin. It was kind of like almost like a rubbery texture. Yeah. Yeah. Like the GI Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like the sleeve on the $6 million man peeled back with the arm. Yeah. It, yeah. It was kind of, it was kind of like that. And she bought me uh commander Koenig, except it wasn't commander Koenig. They uh, they made an error at the uh, probably the Hasbro plant even back then, um, and and they put the uh, they put the professor guy in in the Koenig box. Oh, well, so I was I was I was pretty miffed. Uh, yeah, I could see that. But she also bought me. Uh, it was for Christmas one year. I got my big things were I got that. I got the uh, the toy stun pistol that would you know you could shine you know certain logos from uh from a tv show on the wall and that oh, made like all, cool. the, all the sound effects and stuff so you know it was it was i played with it for hours and hours and hours <laughs> and and she also got me the the play set for the figures of uh of moon base alpha which which was fun but i didn't want to play with the professor so pretty pretty soon all my nego star trek figures took over moon base alpha <laughs> so and I, I still have that over here. So, you know, it's, it, there, there's so much, there's so much influence, especially, especially, uh, you know, the original, the original Star Trek, uh, the only Star Wars trilogy that matters. Um, <laughs> and, oh, and, okay. and, you know, so many other things and most of them are, you know, Western based. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, wow, you just throw like a little karate in there, you know, a little Bruce Lee thrown in with a Western and uh, I'm a happy camper. Yeah, it's funny because uh, today I posted a piece of art that was from Blood and Bullets and it was the, you know, sexy version of the Blackbird character, which is the Native American character. But I posted it into an art group that I founded like four years ago that's on Western art and only Western art, traditional Western art. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was going to take heat from some people who are just not open minded. And the group has grown in, during the time essentially of COVID from 3000 members to 27,000. And wow. right now, and right now it gets two, 300 new members per day. And it's all really super traditional Western art. It's called true fans of Western art. But the, the whole point of what you were, you were saying was, is I was like, you know what, I'm going to post this and see what kind of uh, reaction I get from people going, that's not traditional, you know, cowboys and Indians, Western art. And, and mm -hmm. I prefaced it in the post saying, literally, this is a piece of art from a vampire Western graphic novel. And they're like, you know, people like Native Americans in dress. I, I'm like, did you miss the part about like vampires? Uh, this is this is not they, our they, world. They, they miss the reading part. Uh, yeah, they don't the read alternate. anything. It's look at the picture and judge. Yeah, and I basically said, if this isn't for you, that's fine. Move on. You know, we don't need to get you know negative uh, uh, reactions. And yet, I still ended up kicking a couple of people from the group just due to their reactions because I'm like, apparently, you weren't paying attention when I said. Hey, if this is not for you, it's it's for other people. And the cool part was I ended up actually selling the original because of the post. 
to one of my fans who's already been buying uh, artwork. A uh, uh, friend of mine is down in Texas, but it was that it took that particular post in the group for him to see it and go, oh, that's available. I might be interested. And I was like, you know what? Let me put that on hold for you. And so on, on the one hand, people got their feathers all ruffled. On the other hand, I sold a nice piece of artwork. Yeah. So, you know, win-win. Yeah. I know uh, for the first Blood and Bullets, uh, as soon as I saw it, I fell in love with the, uh, the cover of the color cover of uh, Blackbird holding up her knife with the reflection mm -hmm. of the, right. it, uh, has the, it has Mary's character in the reflection. Not yeah. a lot of people caught that. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I go, Oh, that's the cover. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't care whether it's Chrome hollow foil or just regular. <laughs> oh, that's just a regular cover. Fine. I love that cover. Yeah. And we did a couple I showed it, I showed it off on another stream and everybody was like, Ooh, what's that? It was like a panel. And they're like, Ooh, what's that? I go, that's blood and bullets number one from Monty Moore. And they're like, oh, oh. <laughs> so I, I got a little, I got a little street cred on that on 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 that comic panel because I because I had a because I had some of your art in hand to show off that night. Oh, I appreciate that. That's awesome. Yeah, one of the things that I love is just the the indie community. And, mm -hmm. you know, as even though I started as an indie publisher, I, I published, helped publish. It wasn't my first book. I was only the colorist. But a group of us as a studio published our first comic in 1993. Bunch of greenhorns just out of college. And, you know, when we back then, when you thought about the the indie industry, which was really small, right, indie and kind of underground and stuff like that. And although you had people out there who were doing stuff like uh, maybe Sergio Aragonas doing Gru, mm -hmm. TMNT, you know, at the time, obviously very indie, but a smash hit, right? Breaks out of the indie mold, becomes, you know, one of the biggest mainstream things of the 80s. Uh, Jeff Smith doing oh, Bone. Yeah. You had other indie guys out there who were the few guys in the limelight. But for me, it seemed like the perception was is that you know, those fringe guys, they had a hard time and they had their, their followers and some of them made it to status where you were known Brian Polito, lady death, things like that. But for every Brian Polito, there's a hundred, 200 creators who, you know, sort of, uh, as they say, failed to launch. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we were one of those with our first book. We did produce it. We did pay and make 3000 comics and maybe sell a thousand of them. Uh, right when the industry crashed in like 93. Uh, but it's uh, one of the things that I've come to know in the last five years is how awesome the indie industry is with the fans and how loyal they are and how active they are and how they will support you or a cause when you, you know, want that support and say, Hey, you know, this, this book's going to raise 10 bucks for this cause, or this book's going to raise 20 or whatever. And, you know, now it's something that I'm really proud to be a part of as an indie publisher, which is what I am now, instead of just saying, well, I'm a freelance cover artist, right? So Maverick Art Studio now has, you know, its third graphic novel under its belt with Local Hero 2. And believe it or not, I have 10 projects in the works that either already have artists working on it from my darks, uh, my dark anthology called the midnight cafe, which is going to be like a tales from the dark side, amazing tales. Oh, that's, uh, that's right up my alley. Twilight zone, uh, serial kind of a thing, um, to a, a cult horror. Uh, I have a steam prompt project in the works. We have some true, you know, straight up kind of superhero, but my superheroes are all cryptids. So like Bigfoot and Mothman and the Jersey Devil and things like that as a team. Uh, so we're working on that. And there's just a lot of stuff that's exciting that within the next one to three years, you know, I'll be able to say, you know, I've got five titles out there, not just, not just one and not just pandering to a certain thing. I don't want to just do cheesecake comics. 
And there's a place for that. And I'm a big part of that community because I love drawing and illustrating beautiful women. So I've done work for Zenoscope and Big Dog and many other publishers. But for myself, I want the stories and the content to be as good and as intriguing as the art. And so I don't want to just have my books be sex sells. Hey, look at the, you know, the big chest on this character. You know, that helps sell comics. Don't get me wrong. I want the stories to all have. Well, that helps sell anything. Beautiful but. elements. But some of them, some of the stories and some of the projects won't have that. Right. So they may not be as successful as Loco Hero or Blood and Bullets that have, you know, these amazing superhero lead characters. I mean, one of the books called the, the Book of Mark or Carpe Noctum, which means Seize the Night, is a, is centers around an occult bookstore. And all that that might entail, and it ties in with revelations and the Bible and demons and possession and mass murder. You know, I mean, it's going to be way different and way edgier. And it's still, it's based on a screenplay that I wrote. And this, and when I read the screenplay, when I reread it, I hadn't read it in like six, seven years. And I reread it and I thought, Jesus, this is one of the best things I've ever written. I, I need to put an artist on this because it might not be as commercially successful as other ones, but this is a damn cool story. <laughs> uh, that that makes me think a little bit of the old uh, Friday the 13th television series. Well, and that's the, I, I kind of wanted the store to have that feeling, although it's more bookstore. So in the story, Mark inherits the bookstore from his mother and she was a strong Christian and the store was called The Carpenter. So he rearranges some of the letters, not needing very many, and he changes the story to be called Carpe Noctum, which means seize the night in Latin. And he makes it a, a bookstore that's open to all religions, and it's not a Christian bookstore anymore, and it has things on Hinduism and occultism and voodooism and all these other sort of isms. And he's not a believer himself, per se, in the Bible. But, you know, the tagline sort of is, you know, just because you don't believe in demons doesn't mean they don't believe in you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, and so uh, the woman, uh, the uh, artist that's working on that, Chiara uh, de Francia in France, is already on page like 2025. 20, oh, nice. She's only been working on the project for <coughs> two months. And she's drawing and coloring the whole thing. And wow. so, you know, when that book gets done, I might not put it out as a two-parter or I might put it out as a two-parter or I might say, here it is. Here's the whole thing. It's 80 to 100 pages. You know, it's all it's, it's all in one. Mm -hmm. and In a and, nice uh, hardcover. In, an, in a nice hardcover. You know, here's the matching download of the screenplay if you want to read the screenplay. And between you and me, one of my... Um, uh, my goals is, is that eventually I will take my screenplays and my graphic novels and I will get an agent in Hollywood to market the stories to, uh, for, you know, streaming services, movies, uh, or, uh, you know, TV series like Loco Hero. The first episode that I wrote, it's not a feature film screenplay. It's a pilot episode. So pilot episodes are usually about 60 pages. Mm -hmm. So the first two, the first episode, the first 48 page graphic novel is based on those first 60 pages of the pilot episode. So I could say, Hey, streaming service, whoever that is, wouldn't, isn't this a great unique character? Here's the pilot episode. And here's, you know, the first, hundred pages are a hundred minutes already scripted out for you like uh, storyboards. And if they turn and say, well, that's great. But the only thing that seems to sell is uh, comic book IPs. Well, let me tell you something. It came <laughs> from this. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, I want somebody to walk into, you know, Amazon or somewhere else and stack, you know, plop down a big stack of published graphic novels and go, Hey, here's what Monty Moore turned out in the last two years. <laughs> yeah, knock, knock yourself out. Uh, here's my card, and uh, 
We'll right. be hearing from you, I assume. Right. Yeah. There's more. Oh, what do you need? Oh, you need a killer in a junkyard that recycles people. Yeah. That one's called scrapper. I got that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, There's I'm, a dark I'm, side to me that not a lot of people know about. I write some dark stuff. <laughs> everybody knows me as, as the, as the fun, happy, happy go lucky guy, fan of Westerns, great artist, uh, yeah, they, I think they don't people, know that it, you know I walk in the shadows as well. Yeah, and I think that that's going to be one of the fun parts about um, you know Midnight Cafe and uh, Book of Mark and some of these other you know projects that have an edgy feel. So you find the right artist that has the right look for something, mm -hmm. uh, and you say, "Yep, I'm going down this road." And and once I freed myself from the burden of thinking that I myself had to illustrate all my stories which set me back like 10 years. I'm like, oh, I need to draw that. I need to do that. And I'm like, you're not a comic book artist. I'm a painter. I'm an illustrator. I do covers. Uh, I do promo art. I design characters. But my strong point is not telling a visual story, but I'm pretty good at writing them, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got a few awards for it. So, uh, you know, I'm yeah, it, might, it, might be a it might be a thing, yeah. I I'm confident enough that what I'm churning out is not garbage. And that's enough for me. Uh, so, uh, for me to, you know, continue to do writing and to bring these stories to fruition is super rewarding. And when I first started writing these stories back in 2001, my first story that I, I wrote was called Outpost Earth. And it's also being worked on a graphic novel. It's up to about page 15 or 20 is a sci-fi kind of a story. And people would say, well, what are you going to do with it? And I'm like, I have no idea. I want to market it as a film, but I didn't know how to write screenplays at the time. So in that period, I've gone from learning to write screenplays and flesh out stories and things like that to having the confidence and the understanding of publishing and printing and self-distribution through Kickstarter, which is just an amazing platform. And if we had had this 20 years ago, I'd have been doing it back then. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think the uh, the boom in the indie industry, uh, you know, thanks to uh, you know what some of the bigger publishers are doing with you know their whole thing is yeah, well, uh, they're opening up because they're making a lot of mistakes and missteps, and they're more concerned with toys and film, mm -hmm. uh, and they're they're forgetting the comic book collector, and they're like, oh well, we only produce that so we keep the IP alive, but you know, they've left the door open for the rest of us, which is great. And to be able to sell directly to um, the the consumer and the fan by pre-selling through Kickstarter is amazing. And I did my first one in 2013 with uh, my first self-published, fully self-published art book, uh, which was called Mischief. And I think that was book six or seven for me. And I think I've done nine total. But the, the point being that to be able to now on a more regular basis, like I, I you know, Brian Polito is kind of one of my uh, mentors and inspirations. So I go to him for advice and uh, I still do lady death covers and things, but I pay attention very greatly to what he does because he does it well. Mm -hmm. He focuses on customer service and interacting with fans. He creates great content and, I had the wrong impression of I shouldn't do a Kickstarter too often because it's like going to the well and saying, Hey, you know, I want more money. You know, I have a new project. Can you give me money for it? And I thought, uh, that's going to seem needy. But what you do is you have to flip your thinking and you have to say, no, if fans like your content, it's like being a chef and saying, well, our, our restaurants only open, you know, w once a month. And you're like, well, yeah, but if you were open once a week, I would come eat there once a week because I love what you cook, what you make. Oh mm -hmm. crap. I need to open my restaurant more. And so now saying, all right, I got to drop the hammer creatively and productively to be able to produce four graphic novels a year, four campaigns a year, potentially. Right. If I'm doing graphic novels at almost 50 pages, that's 200 pages of content a year. Mm -hmm. Which for a small publisher like me, you know, that's a lot of work. <laughs> oh yeah. 
for, yeah, for, it, for anybody, it, you know, for anybody it, uh, in the Indies, it's like uh, until until somebody does it themselves, they don't realize uh, how much how much work just goes into setting up the campaign. Well, not only that, but, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about when they think, oh, well, I'm supporting Monty Moore's campaign. He wrote this graphic novel. But there's about 30 to 50 other people who actually are also supported from this. So say our printer has 15 people who work for them. Now a guy like me is coming and saying, well, I need between, say, 5,000 and 10,000 comics a year. Now, Brian Polito's to the point where he's probably printing 50,000 to 100,000 comics a year. And then you also have the, the 10 artists that I'm working with and the sort of 10 or 20 colorists, letterers, editors, proofers, all of the people in between, marketing people, podcast mm -hmm. people, everybody who is part of the industry, sometimes people get content. And other times, if you're a, a, an, an artist who says, hey, I make 100 a page or 150 a page for a comic and that's your rate, right? Negotiate rates with artists. I say, what's your rate? I'm not going to ask you to work cheaper. If I like what you do, that's people, I don't like it when people do that to me. If I say, this is what I charge for a cover. And then I go, oh, wow, I can't afford you. Well, I trust me, I've reached out to several artists who I love their work and you know they have Marvel DC rates, which are, two, 300 a page. And I'm like, man, I love your work. I hope someday my business gets to the point where I can afford to pay that, but I can't afford to pay that, uh, you know, right now, but good for you. You know, I'm not going to ask you to work for less, but all of those funds, like say local hero one made 50 grand, didn't make 50 grand. It, it raised 50 grand. Yeah. It, it raised that much. And then out of that 10 to 15% is about profit. So believe it or not, 35 to 40,000 is hard cost, right? Because mm -hmm. to print all those books is over a $10,000 printing bill. Oh, yeah. To hire Easy. your artists to do the art is a $10,000 printing bill. To mail 600 packages is a six to $10,000 shipping bill. Right. Mm -hmm. Just eating up 30 grand. Right. So the only reason why I bring this up is I don't want people to think, oh, I shouldn't support that project because, you know, money doesn't need 50 grand. Trust me, there's not 50 grand left over. <laughs> and basically what I've done to try to grow my platform is even if I had $10,000 left over, which is significant because I have all these other projects that I want to do. I immediately put all that money to work with other artists. So mm -hmm. whether I, I, I have artists right now, I think in probably five to seven countries and I find them through Facebook. I find them through art groups and I go out there and I say, wow, I like your work. Let me message you. You know, what's your availability? What are your rates? Who have you worked with? How many pages can you do? Can you do a sample? Would you like to draw a character for me? And you know, I pay them to design the characters and then say, Hey, I, I like what I see. Let's proceed. Or, Hey, I haven't heard back from you in two weeks. Seems like you got a lot on your plate. Maybe we'll revisit this another time. Right. Because I, I need consistency and productivity. Mm -hmm. And so that the money from the profits from the first couple of Kickstarters is already out there back in the industry, in the industry. And it's supporting 15 to 20 artists and creators. And to me, as, as somebody who was in that position, 20, 30 years ago, it's super fulfilling. Yeah, because you're you're taking the 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 profit money basically and and flipping it back into three or four other projects to to get them uh yep. kick kickstarted for a better word. So yeah. so and you're gonna, you know, so you're way bear, ahead. Well, it's gonna bear so much more fruit for me because if somebody gives me uh 10 seeds instead of me selling those seeds, I can go plant those seeds. It's going to take a while, but then mm -hmm. I'm going to have 10 trees and I'd be able to sell those 10 trees for more than I could 10 seeds. And so right now my, my plants, they're all out there growing. And most of the time, because a lot of my artists are in different time zones, 
I wake up in the morning and I look at my message and I've got like new pages from three projects. I'm like, I got art here from Bigfoot. I got art here for, uh, uh, you know, horror story. And I got art here for sci-fi, you know? And so I'm art directing and I'm saying, oh yeah, that looks great. And 99% of the time, I don't make changes to the art. As long as they're doing what the story says it needs to be, I try to give the artist freedom because I see something up here, but I know that all my clients do too. And I produce something different than they see. So for me, as long as I look and, and it's telling the story, or even if I need to do a little bit of rewriting on what's on the page, that's okay. It's going to make a great story. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is going to know that, you know, the guy was supposed to walk through that door before he says this. Okay. So what I change, he's already in the room. Okay. It's not the end of the world. It's like, you know, nobody ever goes and does a shooting script like Alfred Hitchcock used to do where scene by scene, it was already planned out and he could give it to the cinematographer or the director and they go, Oh, yep. Whole thing's done. Right. Comics usually don't work that way. There's a lot more fluidity and trust in your, the artists and the creatives you brought on board. Mm -hmm. so, so I, I never realized I would take that much fulfillment from it. Otherwise, I would have had my foot on the gas in indie publishing five years ago instead of three. But you're there now. And... I'm there. I'm there now, and and we're we're ripping ripping down the street. Um, you know, even when Blood and Bullets, when I first started Blood and Bullets and Loco Hero, I started with an artist who was in the Philippines, and he ran into a bunch of personal problems. But because I was so busy all the time with other projects, I was like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. It can just kind of sit back there. Nobody even knows about it. And so for three, four years, it just languished. It didn't go anywhere. I didn't even get 10 pages done. Then you find the right artist and suddenly you're getting five, six pages a week. And you're like, oh, oh, this is quite nice. I could, I could publish and print this within, you know, a year. And, and so now that's, that's the goal. And uh, it's a it's a good goal to have to have all these projects on on board and all you know all these creatives that you that you've got uh, working through your publishing company and Absolutely. Uh, it's it's always good to be busy. Yes, and actually the 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 comment I just made reminded me that I need to take a note. There's an artist I need to get back to who turned in pages. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so I'm writing down that I need to get back to them about just a couple of clothing changes. Well, so it's good we went down that road because now yep. you're like, oh, yeah, I got to get back to so-and-so. And yep. Yeah, that project's called uh, Frostbite, and it's, uh, it's a uh, winter X Games meets the Howling kind of story. <laughs> Werewolves in the snow. It's it's been it's been a great uh, couple of years for uh, for horror books coming back. And well, I hope so because I, that's actually my biggest fear is when I go to, you know, Kickstarter with these other projects that are darky and more edgy and less sexy that they will the the right audience will hear about them uh, and say, hey, that that's my cup of tea. I like things that go bump in the night. Oh yeah, uh, I I do as long as they're not going bump in the night in my house. Uh, right? Yeah, safe. You want then it to I, be then safe. I, then I get a little nervous, you know. Well, I love things like uh, well, there's a lot of different movies out there, but like I I love a great story like the movie Seven. Oh, whereas yeah. I find very little redemption in in films like Hostel uh, or the the green inferno and cannibalism and the over the top gore uh but i've probably seen seven you know 25 times right now seven or even the early saw films they're not there for pure gore but there's a well-crafted story and at the end you go ah i didn't see that coming right mm -hmm. and so i like to have things in my stories where it's either a twist or it's entertainment and you go, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. It's, uh, there's, there's so many books that you just mentioned that I'm like, Oh, 
what can I sell so I have extra money to back more books? <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> well, you uh, can sell blood. You know, people always need blood. Yeah, they they don't want they don't want, want my blood. I've got I've got too much wrong with me. So I I try. I'm like, put it through a strainer. I'm like, I go, can can I sell my blood? And and they call up my medical charge and they're like, uh, no, 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 thank you, no. But uh, yeah, I uh, I've been excited to. Uh, to read blood and bullets and, and see what else you have going on. And, uh, well, on the loco hero campaign, because it did come out during COVID, you know, this time, March, April, last year mm -hmm. in the second campaign, we did bring back the honor bound edition of issue one. So people can, we, we, we caught a little bit of flack of people saying, Hey man, you know, I'm late to the party, but where's issue one? I want to get that too. So we did add that in. And then we have a separate campaign over on Indiegogo for a re-release of issue one. It has eight new covers, four from the art core team, as I call it, and four from variant cover artists like Paolo Pantalena, Jamie Tyndall, and uh, Shikari. And that's a perfect bound edition instead of saddle stitch. And it also ends in two, excuse me, in two days. And We've got a hundred backers over there and we just hit the 5,000 mark today or yesterday. So between the two <coughs> campaigns, we have 600 backers, 600 and 625 maybe. And there's, there's probably a lot of people that actually bought issue one that are going back because they want those other variant covers. We have, we have a couple of completist uh, collectors who, you mm -hmm. know, as insane as it might sound, if there's 25 different covers between the, the variation, yes, it's all the same book, but those are the first issues of number one. And they have every one of them because they're like, hey, what if Loco Hero ends up being the next spawn? And in 20 years, people are like, yo, I got one of the number ones and there's only a thousand to fifteen hundred of them out there. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause these aren't big numbers, you know, spawn number one, I'm sure they're, or, 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 you know, more modern day popular ones, even the death of Superman, right. There was, I don't know, 50,000 copies or something. So we all went out there and thought it was crazy. Cause we, you know, in college I paid 50 bucks for a comic and 50 bucks now for a comic is, is, uh, is a, is a, a more normal, normal regular price for some new release re-release books and some books you know like an artist proof book if there's only four of them with a number right they're 200 250 bucks when they're brand new yeah it's uh it's uh it get it gets a little crazy it's mm -hmm. you know and there's there's so many uh there's so many campaigns out there and they're selling original art pages from the book on the campaign Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did that with Local Hero number one. And we got 10 people uh, uh, sign up and get that as a pledge from the first campaign. Uh, but the problem is, is uh, it's not really a problem, but my artist switched to digital, uh, Donnie. And so there's no new pages for issue two. And so I don't, the only project that I have going right now that I'm getting the original pages that I can resell are the Bigfoot story that's going to be in Midnight Cafe. It's called Endangered Species. And I am getting the original pages from that, but I would say only about 5 or 10% of comic artists are working traditionally. Yeah, mo most of uh, I know uh, quite a few that are doing, uh, doing traditional pencils and then scanning in and doing... Uh, you know, doing digital inks and then passing that file on to the colorist to uh Yeah, yeah, and that's more common. And I don't even have a problem getting the original pencils, even if they're roughs, because people still enjoy having those in their collections. So Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I I've, I've got a few of those. Yep. Uh and then there, you know, there's other uh artists who you know, their pens are so tight, you really want to scan them in that you just crank up the, the contrast, you know, and they look like inks and you just hand them off to your colorist. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the indie scene, uh, 
we have, we're going to take a, a look at Mavericks Origins Volume 1. And this campaign is live on Indiegogo right now. And every 10 copies they, they sell, they donate one to a group. And God forgive me, I forget the name of the group. But this group uh, that they're donating them to sends them out to the military. Oh, super cool. Yeah, well, I might so, have to support that campaign. I like that. And of course, so, my studio is called Maverick Art Studio. So I like a title called Mavericks. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, we're going to take a look at it, and we'll be right back after these messages from Mavericks. War is a topic of vital importance. A subject of inquiry that cannot be ignored. It is a matter of life and death. It can be a road to safety or to ruin. In the alternate version of our world, brought to the brink of total collapse, rival nations fight for global domination, and elite pilots in futuristic combat suits wage war on the battlefield of tomorrow. Now, six brave soldiers on a seemingly routine rescue mission will encounter more than they bargained for and uncover a dangerous secret that could change their world if they live long enough to see it. Wow, nice trailer. Yeah, uh, he was editing that together for for a couple of months. He f- I bet. That's he pretty finished, impressive. He finished the edit on that trailer hours before they went live with the campaign. And is the campaign doing gangbusters? Oh yeah, it's doing it's doing really good. Cool. Uh, you know, so uh, they're doing they're doing uh, they're doing the you know the thirty day, and then before the thirty days up, they're upping it for another thirty because it trips the algorithm and uh now, so can you be, do that can you extend a kickstarter for another 30 days i thought you had to set time kickstarter you can't but they're on indiegogo indiegogo they uh you can extend it uh an extra 30 days when you get oh. so like right around you know day 28 or 29 you go in you go in you extend it for another 30 days and then you can keep it on demand so it's an open open source store Right. Yeah. We planned on doing that, but I didn't know that you could open the store for, or, uh, you know, extend it for another 30 days. So that might be something I'd be interested in. Yeah. That's, uh, and I, I found out through, you know, through doing, through doing these episodes that, uh, um, some people put in for the, for the full 60. And then I, I hear other people telling them, goes, no, don't do that. Put it in for 30. And then when you do it for another 30 after, it triggers it and it bounces you back up so more people will see the campaign. Okay. Well, so, that might be worthwhile. The nice so, part for me, because that one's already done, We, you could still start fulfilling your orders because on Indiegogo, people have already paid their contribution. Mm-hmm. So if you had it and you were already producing it, rather than somebody saying, hey, man, why do I have to wait another 30 days? You could start just shipping all their products. Yeah, once it's in demand, uh, I know... Uh, William Quinton from uh, Sinopa Publishing did that. He he did his his main campaign on uh, on Kickstarter, and then he did the campaign for the same book over on Indiegogo, and went. Uh, he had already gotten all the books in from Kickstarter, and he you know he over he over orders on them. So I mean, he was on a live stream I think with Pops and. Uh, he had gotten a couple of orders in while he was on the stream and he's sitting there on the stream packing up and oh. <laughs> uh, packing up everything in a Gemini and, you know, giving the guy a, a, a shout out. Hey, so-and-so, uh, I just this got your true. order in. 
it's packed <laughs> up. I'm going to address it as soon as the stream's over and it's going to go in the delivery box for the post office in the morning. That's pretty funny. <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, you know, stuff like stuff like that is great. And being able to leave to leave a project in demand, uh, you know, it's people will see it afterwards or maybe somebody didn't have the money for it and they had to pay, you know, important things like, you know, the mortgage and the electric bill and stuff. <laughs> right. And uh, they're like, I got to put this on the back burner and hope I can get it later. And with the, with Indiegogo, with the, uh, with the open source store for the in demand, it's, uh, it just, it just helps get more and more books out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So let's go into this one. The current Loco Hero 2 campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably have to wrap up here shortly, but um, we can uh, go through real quickly. There's there's uh, different tiers that start out with both the Art Core Edition. You can also just get just the purely digital edition. And then today we uh, just released the final cover. Um, I think it was right above this part of the update. If you scroll back up on rewards, is there, huh? Maybe it's underneath the tier. Scroll back down. There should have been a release today. I thought that maybe focused, uh, no, I guess not. It's actually, so we just released the final cover today. That's the, um, called the dreamscape cover and it's between uh lucho perillo and myself and so he drew it oh, and nice. i painted it so if you scroll down to more towards the bottom you'll be able to see the reveal of that it'll be in the rock star covers so this talks about the story shows the quality of the interior art tells how i came up with it uh and then interior page is kind of a sample uh, of how that looks and then talking about issue one there. Those are some nice testimonials. Uh, then we start getting into, there's me and Josh. Uh, here you go. So rockstar covers, you got uh, Richard Ortiz, uh, uh, Royal, uh, colored by Moss. That one's great. Uh, Elias chats out is, uh, so the one on the right, Perillo and more we debuted today. So Lucho nice. drew that. And then I did, an acrylics mixed media version since he normally does oil. So it gives it a different look. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I saw that on your page. I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> so that's the only fully painted one in the campaign for this particular one. Then we've got RB white, uh, Paolo Pantelena, uh, Mike DeBalfo on the left and Mike Chrome on the right. And uh, great colors by Ula Moss and Sanju and many others. Then these are some of the covers. The one on the right is by our interior artist team. So people can select the art core tier cover if they like that. And then the other three covers are art that is mine uh, that showcase different elements of the character uh, from art from one and two. And um, then we start below this, we start getting into some package tiers. Now this one here, this is a special one. This is called the Soldier On Edition. And her character is a veteran. And so in this particular piece, you see, you know, a soldier in the rain. And it's almost like they're sort of bleeding the flag colors yeah. or as the reflection maybe. But then the spirits of these warriors in the past are uh, standing behind almost like a legacy. And so Brina's character would be on the right as the uh, jaguar warrior, uh, as the female one. And then... In the upper left, you can see a figure in the background, and that's who this particular cover was dedicated to. And that was a young man who was a military veteran who did struggle with PTSD, and he did take his life. And so this cover was commissioned during our last campaign. And so the woman who bought this, this was her son, and she commissioned a cover, which is now a published cover, and the proceeds from this cover go to Operation Second Chance to help our veterans. That's awesome. And so. and man, that cover, that's such a powerful cover too. 
Yeah, it's uh, and I decided not to go full color because when I did the base layers and I did all the blacks and I just the last thing I added was the flag. I was like, you know, this piece doesn't need color. It's just going to take away from it. Yeah, it's just so stark and powerful as it is. I, I love that cover right there. So that's called the Soldier On Edition. Uh, and uh, again, proceeds from that one go to, our, to that. You can also select any of the covers that you really like. You want to put it on your wall. You can back a pledge level that gets you any of the covers as a print, or you can do it as an add-on uh, as well. So people can say, oh, I, I, these are my two favorite covers. I'm going to get two prints and a book. So you, you can a la carte that. You can over pledge a certain pledge level because you can only pick one pledge level. So then the rest of it you either do as an over pledge or what we call an add on. And you used to have to do the add on at the end of the campaign. Mm -hmm. But since since uh, within the last six months, Kickstarters realized how much money they're losing from people getting that pledging that money in the post campaign period, in the crowd ox survey period, backer kit. Yeah. So now you pledge and you do those add-ons within Kickstarter. Yeah, that's that's smart. I, I love that Westworld cover. Yeah, so that one is a is a, a Easter egg cover that has eight or nine different films referenced from Westworld, Old and New, Wild Wild West, Old and New, things like. Uh, Van Helsing and Sleepy Hollow and Golden Compass, things that have kind of a steampunk, you know, Western kind of vibe. And so there was one of my fans who got a $500 prize package because he was the first person to name every movie. Wow. that That's a diehard uh, pop culture buff right there. Yeah. And I was like, no, I, I said, I would think to myself, I made this way too hard. There's nobody who's going to get all of these, like all nine or whatever. <coughs> it was a guy who got it within an hour and a half of me posting the image. And I, was like, I was like, damn, that wasn't hard enough. I'm, I'm out of $500 prize pack. <laughs> yeah. Like it took me longer to think of the, think of the, you know, oh, yeah. references to put in. Yeah. The piece of art took like nine hours. <laughs> So yeah, there's just a, there's a lot of great covers from different artists. So we're doing some specialty editions that are linens. There's hollow foils. We're doing a couple that are spot foil. So these four that you see in here, these are actually limited edition numbered copies. Mm -hmm. And so within the pledges and the add-ons, all of those add up to you know 150 or 100. And then the one that we just added today. If you scroll down lower, you'll see the Lucho Perillo on the right. And we're going to do spot foil, just like we did on the Royal one on the left, where we dropped out all the color in mm -hmm. the background. And then all of those white light elements that show through, those are all silver chrome. Yeah. Rather than being hollow chrome, actually, is we call spot foil. And so uh, scroll down a little bit more and click on the play button when it says, what is spot foil? There you go. Click on that. Oh, uh, it reset. It go? go back up. Oh, okay. Uh, there yep. Yeah, there we go. So that was just a little three second video that the printer sent. So you hear printers in the background, but you can see the iridescence when you play the, the, the movie of you get the reflective nature of the spot foil and it just looks super sharp. So they just made a couple of prototypes for us. Yeah, I, I got a, I got a, uh, I think it was a San Diego Comic Con uh, special, you know, anniversary edition of uh, Mad Love uh, okay. from, from DC, and they, they, that's what they did. Like all the backgrounds were, were the, was the spot foil, and the rest mm -hmm. of it was basically, you know, the cutout of Joker and Harley, and, right. and the yeah. title. That was it. So yeah, yeah, it's that's very cool. So then this is a, a one-off book. We, we decided to try out a tier and I wasn't sure if it was going to work or not, where there was literally only one book created with this. And so, and when the campaign launched, that tier got snapped up within seven minutes. And wow. so this cover is going to probably be either a gold hollow foil or a gold metal. And this was an edited page that was from within issue one. 
And I decided I, I wasn't going to have the rated R material inside the book. So we edited it and there was some very carefully crafted smoke and things like that that came across the figure. Mm -hmm. And so because that page was never seen like that in the book, we reached out to the backer of that and said, what do you think of having the only cover that has this interior page in it as the tier one operator? It's a one of a kind book. And he's like, absolutely love it. That's, I, that's what I want. So we revealed that today as well. Wow. So people can just go through, they can look at the different packages. There's things that combine, you know, and move all the way up to upper tier commissions where people can get a hand-drawn sketch cover. They can get a fully painted cover. You know, those gets, that gets into the thousands of dollars, you know, kind of tier. But, you know, at that level, you're getting the original art that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. And even while we've been on this podcast, we had several new backers who actually picked up some like a field kit packages and stuff like that that are like 130 bucks. You get some prints, you get some books and um, things like that. So the packages kind of just keep growing where you get more and more of, you know, the products just depending on, you know, how much you want to collect and how deep you want to go on the Kickstarter. Yeah. Like this one right here, the total domination package. Yep. 42, 42 comics, 13, 13 prints. prints. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and, and, you know, there, we probably only offered five or 10 of those and maybe, you, you know, some campaigns all 10 sell out and other ones only two, three people, you know, sort of maybe go that deep. Um, here's the Mike DeBalfo and Monty Moore art. That's Mike's drawing and I painted it and we decided to offer the original in the commission, in the Kickstarter. Wow. So that's the framed art. And then here's his pencil drawing, which is also available. Oh, it's gorgeous. And I offer the the originals for the same price that I haven't invested in that artist. So I'm not making money off of their back. I'm just the one who's able to offer it and sell it to the collector. So you're buying from the publisher. So. so here's some of the stretch goals. We decided rather than doing a pen and a magnet and a sticker and a patch and, you know, things that we had done with some other Kickstarters that we would do a series of trading cards. And so only backers of this campaign get, you know, these cards will never be reproduced again. So um, we just yesterday when we hit 30,000, we unlocked the blue hollow foil card. So if you scroll down, you'll see that there's a red, then a silver and a blue, like a red, white, and blue. So there's a red foil, nice. then there was a silver foil with the uh, soldier on art, and then just yesterday we hit thirty thousand, and we decided to do the Paolo Pantalena Nightbringer art with a blue foil. Wow! Trading cards have come back in a big way. Well, it's something that people said that they liked, and and mm -hmm. um, uh, it's it's less risky to ship paper products with paper products. So obviously uh, people like that uh, yeah. because you're not, you know, Hey, my shot glass broke and it damaged all my comics. You know, people reach out to me and go, Hey, I make shot glasses. And I'm like, Hey, great for you, but I don't want to ship a shot glass with a comic book. Yeah, and they're like, really. Oh, we'll ship it separately. You're like, great. That's going to cost me another bucks to ship. No, thanks. <laughs> so, there you have it. People can uh, read through the campaign at their leisure and read all about the project and the artwork and uh, uh, lend their support or share out the campaign to other people they think might enjoy it. Yeah, if you've already if you've already backed this, uh, make sure you're sharing it out every place you get social with your media. And uh, if you haven't, definitely head over and and peruse the campaign. Uh, it might it might take you uh, the rest of the night to go through the entire thing trying to make up your mind of, of which <laughs> package or, you know, add-ons or, you know, what prints you want. And, uh, you know, and then you can start drooling over the cards that have been released for the sketch goals too. So. Yeah. And you, you, you know, sometimes we, you know, we try to throw an extra swag. We, we try to be responsive with, uh, questions. And sometimes people have suggestions on the campaign, like, Hey, why don't you do a level where, you know, everything is all there and I can click that button and get it all. And we're like, okay, but it would be really expensive. And they're like, yeah, yeah. But that, that's how I roll. And so one of the reasons why we have things like 
the full Monty or the total domination is because fans ask for it. Right. Because I was like, Oh, I, that sounds like people wouldn't want that at, you know, a five or $600, you know, comics package. And then you put it out there and then the next day you have three people who've already got it. And you're like, yeah, okay. I was wrong. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to spend all night looking through this. Just point me in the direction that, uh, you know, no matter what it's named that I get everything. Right. And the thing is, is it's just awesome to have that kind of support where somebody might say, I love what you do. I want to support it at this kind of level. And they know they're going to get high quality products. You know, whether it's the printing, it's like the poker chip, the patch, all the stuff you got in Blood and Bullets. That was a really fun, nice oh, yeah. uh, swag package that had, you know, 11, 12 items in it. And we got tons of kudos from everybody to put that kind of effort into it. You know, a custom patch that's drawn by me and is like, man, I want to put that on my bag or your backpack or whatever. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've i been using that book bookmark since the day I got the thing and right first, first it first it was on the book it came with and it's it's moved to two or three graphic novels since then and it's That's it's awesome. it's in another it's in another one uh from uh mike mignola right now oh she gets around that girl oh yeah you know she's <laughs> she's killing it <laughs> she does <laughs> well thank you for uh having me on the show it's been a, a wonderful experience being able to talk about all the projects and uh, oh just, yeah, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for what the future holds for uh, for your publishing because uh, there's there's a bunch you. of books in there, especially the dark stuff. I like yeah. the dark stuff. It's coming. It's in the background. It's happening right now. I just can't yeah, show no. you. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is awesome, and uh, that uh, that tribute cover is absolutely gorgeous. So thank uh, you. Appreciate it. I I don't even have to worry about which cover I want. I already know which cover I want. So. This is the original art. So this is going to uh, Vanessa who backed that level on our previous campaign. Mm -hmm. And so this is the actual illustration uh, that I did for that art. And uh, uh, this will be framed and on her wall. It's a mixed media. It's a combination of colored pencils, airbrush markers and hand painting. Wow. So that's gorgeous. I appreciate everybody checking out the uh, the art in the, in the campaign as I knock stuff over here in the studio. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll be back again for a future show on an upcoming campaign. Oh, that would be awesome. Great. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here. Uh, Monty is very busy if you didn't catch that during the uh, during the the entire talk of how many projects he has going on. Well, those are just um, mine. I actually have to go yeah. work on a Lady Death cover now, so I have deadlines for other clients too. <laughs> oh, he's always, always busy, and uh, this will be this will be uploaded to uh, hradio.org, my uh, my podcast platform, and will be Great. available uh, later on this evening anywhere you can get a podcast. So, right on, uh, Monty. Thank you so much. Uh, have thank a wonderful you, night, and uh, we'll look forward to more great things coming out of you. Bam! Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>